Okay, I'm sure you realize this already, but every one of these medications matter, as well as every one of these. Yeah, that's right. At some point, I've been on all of these medications, and I thought we needed to stop and talk about that. Hit the subscribe button and the bell notification to become part of the Transplant Helper community. Hey folks, welcome back to the Transplant Helper again today. My name is Jim Merle, and as you saw there in the teaser, that's right, today we're talking all things medication related. Now, as a disclaimer, right out of the gate, I completely realize that not every one of us are going to be on exactly the same medications across the board. As a matter of fact, even if we were, we're going to be on different dosages as well as the fact that we're going to have different reactions to those medications. And so one medication that might help me is going to actually harm you or at least make you feel like poop you know you know how it goes but anyway as a whole the majority of us as transplant patients are on quite a bit of medications whether it be all at one time or over the course of years our medications are going to change quite often there are going to be some adjustments some some you know tweaking that goes on and every day things may get better or get worse in my case i've been having some difficulty lately particularly with some weakening in my heart muscle as well as some spillover or some fluid on my lungs and in general we haven't yet found the specific cause of that however we have come to know that there is at least a possibility that i could be having some interactions between some medications or maybe one medication is not working for me as it should yada yada you totally know the deal so i thought because of that because i'm having some issues and i really been doing a lot of digging lately to try to understand my medications even better i thought now would be the very perfect time to share with you those medications as well as to tell you a little bit about the potential interactions that you may have if you are on some of these or even something like some of these okay so with that being said i'm going to go across my medications here kind of pick up each bottle show you what i'm taking right now specifically what those medications are used for and then like i say when we get toward the end i'm going to tell you about some interactions that i think i may be having that may be causing me some difficult and that might be the same as your story as well but let's take it from the top starting out with those most important those anti-rejection meds you know the medications that if you don't take anything else you need to take these every day on time every time and in the right way and for me that comes down to just a couple really one added to that i'll mention but specifically i take a medication known as microphenolate now many of you may know this is my fordic probably all the same difference, but microphenolate slash my 40 basically is exactly what you would assume. It is an anti-rejection type of drug. Now, it can come with some issues specifically in that many times you have to be adjusted on the dosage or maybe even swap to a different brand or go from the generic to the brand name, vice versa, because it can give you some issues, particularly with the stomach. If you're dealing with stomach upset, that sort of thing, this is one of those medications you need to point the finger at because it just might be it. But again, very, very important medication. Secondary to that, and most of us are on a form of this, I'm also on a drug called Tacrolimus. Now, I think that's the generic name for the Prograph, but nonetheless, Tacrolimus Prograph, that's something you're going to hear pretty much across the board in the transplant world. There are different variations. Sometimes you'll be on a, a close cousin of this, not specifically this, but basically whether your heart, lung, liver, kidney, pancreas, or whatever, Tacrolimus and or Prograph may be a part of your regimen. And for me, I've not had that many issues with this. However, it does cause, like the like the previous one, a little bit of stomach upset can cause some uh, some headaches. That sort of thing is one of the real side effects I dealt with in the past at larger doses, as well as can cause some of those trembles, some of those shakes, as we call that. We oftentimes blame prednisone for that, which I'm no longer on. That's the devil's drug. But we oftentimes blame prednisone for that when, in essence, Tacrolimus, Tacrolimus is how I generally say it, or Prograph can be the culprit in that. But that's one of the medications I'm on. An additional medication I'm on that is not specifically related to the anti-rejection drugs is a drug known as Dautalzine. At least that's how I say it. Now, generally speaking, Dautalzine is a blood pressure, blood 
pressure. Why can't I say that today? A blood pressure regulating drug. And and for me, it does a little bit of that. It does help me with a little bit of my hypertension, my blood pressure that's a little high on the on the edge of being high blood pressure, kind of that pre-hypertension stuff. It does help me a little bit with that. But more specifically, what it's actually being used for in my regimen is the dialtalzine is a drug that they've added to help keep the tacrolimus or tacrolimus prograph in my bloodstream. Now, I know I'm giving three different pronunciations for that, but same drug. I'm talking about prograph. But the dialtalzine helps to keep that in your bloodstream. So a lot of times if you're having issues with that tacrolimus level or prograph level bouncing up and down, you may find that they'll add a medication like this just to help to keep that balance. And whether or not that works or how that works, I don't know, but I know for me it has worked. So in general, we've really not made any changes over the last few years. And that's really those three right here, you might say, are basically my only anti-rejection drugs at this point. Now, I'm not on anything else because I've never had any rejection. I've come up R0 every time I've ever been uh, biopsied or tested, so I've just not had any issues. So it was pretty easy to get mine regulated in the beginning, and we pretty much stayed flat and stuck with these at the same dosage now for years. And I think overall I'm doing my pretty, pretty well my best at that. Now, the next grouping of medications I want to talk about really are the medications that are kind of just side notes, and they're very specific to what your needs are, you know, what your conditions were and potentially could be, and how they treat that. And the first one's very simple. It's simply what we used to call a baby aspirin. It's at 81 milligram aspirin. It's only there as kind of a protectant, kind of a look out in the future there to try to prevent some of the blockages, some of the uh, calcification some of the issues that can come up with a heart transplant patient after even though they didn't occur before now for me i've been told many times that the issue of my heart i knew this part was uh related to birth therefore it was a congenital issue but throughout the years growing up till i was 38 and needing the transplant itself i had had no real issues with calcification or you know, whatever else you would call that, just didn't need it. But as a precautionary measure, they pimped me in on 81 milligram medication. That's the only blood thinner type medicine I'm on, although it's not a specific blood thinner. That's the only medication I'm on related to that. But oftentimes you'll be on a drug like that just to keep you safe, just to be that buffer. In addition to that, this is unrelated to transplant, really. It was discovered pretty early on that uh, it was the potential if you're on drugs like microphenolate and on Prograph, Tancrolimus, those types of drugs, particularly if you're on long-term use, high doses steroids, which I have been on that prednisone in the past, they're going to need to add a calcium supplement to that. In my case, we use calcium carbonate. They're going to add a calcium supplement to that, and that is to prevent the potential for the breakdown of the bones, which would eventually be called osteoporosis. Now, I don't have osteoporosis. I've got a condition known as osteopenia, which is kind of the precursor, kind of the first warning signs that osteoporosis has begun. And again, that goes back to the medications. It goes back to a history of that prednisone and such. Thankfully, I'm not on it anymore. So hopefully, by taking the extra calcium, I can keep my bones strong, keep them from being brittle, and, you know, just keep on a regular path until I get old and it, it happens anyway. So one of the supplements I'm on there would be calcium carbonate. In addition to that, I happen to be on a vitamin D supplement. Now, this happens to be an over-the-counter one that they use. I've had the prescription. This just comes out cheaper. It's the same thing. But I use a vitamin D3 supplement. Matter of fact, this one is 1,000 UI or I use per day. Uh, I've been on higher dosages than that. As a matter of fact, I've taken as much as 50,000 a week uh, just to get my levels up to where they need to be. Not doing that right now, but vitamin D is excellent, absolutely excellent when it comes to immune support. And you can get most of your vitamin D if you spend a lot of time outside in the sun, about 20 minutes a day, you can absorb enough to get you by. You may need a booster like this just to keep things a little on the higher end because I forget the numbers, but really, seriously, like 80-something percent of Americans are vitamin D deficient. And it's not something that's going to necessarily harm you by taking it, especially if you take it naturally, going out in the sun. 
other than we protect our skin. It's one of those things, however, that can really make a big difference. I'm confident. I couldn't prove it on paper, but I'm extremely confident that many of the things I have not caught, I've not been sick with the regular colds, the flus, the viruses in general, comes down to the fact that I always keep my vitamin D levels up toward that top end, and I do that by the natural use of it getting the sun as well as the supplement and they keep a good track on that when i go into clinic to see where my levels really are to see if i need to take higher or lower dosages at least for a time but for me i take basically one of these in the morning and one at night and it seems to keep me up you'll be very different but that's one of the things i'm on kind of a supplemental type thing in addition to that one of the medications i've been taking for a long long time we'll talk more about this one later is a magnesium oxide now there are a couple of different forms of this as well I actually take the highest oral dose that I'm aware you can actually take. I take magnesium oxide, 400 milligrams, times three, times three times a day. So what is that? Four and four is 12. That's 1,200 times three per day. And that's the maximum I think anybody can take. After that, you need to go in and have an IV run to try to get your magnesium levels up. And there's some specific reasons why you would take magnesium oxide and all of it comes down to the overall health of your body. And magnesium, and particularly a deficiency in it, again, we'll mention later, uh, can cause a lot, a lot of problems. And it can cause problems with, with your heart itself, with your ability to, to get a deep breath, uh, with your sleeping habits. Again, your immune system is tied to this. Just a lot of things that can be problematic if the magnesium level gets low. And I'll try to do a video specifically just about magnesium, how to handle it, and, and what are safe levels of magnesium a little bit later. But again, I'm not a doctor, so don't take my word for that, even when I do that video. But magnesium is another one of those supplemental things that I happen to be on. Now, as far as the other medications I'm on, uh, I'm on a couple of different medications for very specific reasons to me. For example, I take uh, sumatriptan, which is basically, um, uh, what's the word? I forget the other other brand for that, or the real brand for that. Anyway, it's, it's a medication for migraines. It's an as-needed type thing. It's not a migraine prevention. It's more of a migraine stopper. If you want to call it Imitrex, it's Imitrex. This is a generic brand of Imitrex, basically, Sumatriptan. Been very effective for me. Doesn't work for everyone, uh, but for me, it's very effective. If, if I start to get a migraine, which I've had them all my life, they've been very severe, you can take one of these. This is 50 milligrams. I can take one of these if I take it immediately when the first symptom or aura comes on. Generally, it'll it'll at least reduce the symptoms, if not make it go away. Now, some side effects. This particular one causes my heart to raise, causes my bones to ache and my muscles to ache. And that can go on for hours. But if you've ever had a real serious migraine, you know, eh, this that this sounds better than that. So uh, I take this Sumatriptan for my migraines. You probably don't take that at all. Next one here, probably... I would say 50% of us take something like this, not this, but I take Zopidine. At least that's what I call it. It's basically generic Ambien, and it's for sleep. I have a terrible time sleeping all the way back from, I think, the actual night after my transplant. Doctors walked in, said, you know, you're still laying here awake. Do you need something to help you sleep? Sure, I'll take it. They bring it in, and from that day forward, I've done many videos about this. I've been pretty much addicted to this. I don't abuse it, but I'm addicted to it. I pretty much have to have it to sleep. At least I think that I do. Uh, but anyway, it is for me, it works well. There can be a lot of side effects, a lot of problems that come along with this Ambien, Zopidine type stuff. Be very cautious. And actually, I would suggest you consider other options first and uh, make this your last result if you have to. Obviously, it's a prescri prescription, so you got to be under your doctor's guidance anyway. But that medication for me, you know, every ounce of sleep I've had in the last eight years has in some ways been related to this drug. So one of those I take. So that's basically the anti-rejection drugs, the supplemental drugs, the drugs that only I take. And then there are a few more right here that have been added over the last few months to deal with different and various issues. The first one is, uh, and, and I don't say these exactly right, so I apologize, Furosemide, furosemide, basically, and I can't read the fine print very well, but this is Lasix. So if you've got some fluid retention, particularly in your abdomen, your hands, your face, your your legs, a lot of times they'll put you on furosemide 
Lasix. And we would call that the PP drug <laughs> because once you take it, you better get near a bathroom because eventually it's going to start taking fluid off. And if you see yourself having to take this, you know, every day or having to take larger and larger doses of it, mine is an as needed bottle and that's it. But if you see that, you really, really need to stay on top of that. Really need to be communicating well with your team because excess amounts of fluid retention are happening for a reason. And uh, those reasons could be anything from, you know, real mild that your your diet's just screwed up and you eat too much salt or on to the more extreme, you could have some issues, you know, up into heart failure so or kidney failure. So you really need to stay on top of this. Be careful with it. I take it as needed. Generally, most days I don't even have to have one. But sometimes I get a little bloated in my belly and get some extra fluid by the end of the day. I might take one of these to help me out. And by the way, on a side note, if you are following your fluid intake output, it's a very good idea at times, but watch specifically those scales. When you get on the scale, if you have gained or lost more than five pounds in 24 hours, that that needs an immediate phone call to your doctor and let them know. They may disregard it. They may say, hey, pop another one of these, but you still need to get that checked out nonetheless. Another medication I'm on, and have been on for several months, and this really gets down to the nitty-gritty, and I'm about to start talking about those interactions, is a drug called metoprolol. Now, metoprolol, again, is kind of in the class or the family of one of those uh, blood pressure type medications. It can do a lot to lower the blood, lower the blood pressure and to lower the heart rate specifically if you're having issues and, and different arrhythmias and such, and particularly a, a really high heart rate. Now, most of us post heart transplant, we're going to have a higher heart rate where the average Joe might have, you know, a heart rate of 70 beats per minute. We may ride right at that 100 line or a little bit over for years and years. And that comes down to the vagus nerve being cut and uh, the likelihood of it growing back, not really high, although it can. But with a vagus nerve cut, you're just going to get higher heart rates. Your body doesn't regulate its heart rate in the same way. It adapts and over time using medications, it can... And, you know, it can be brought to a level that's comfortable for you. But nonetheless, uh, this is what this does. Now, when I first started complaining about having some issues, being lightheaded, uh, shorter breath, uh, heart uh, palpitations, different missed beats and that sort of thing, way back in July, they went ahead and threw this drug, metoprol, on me as, again, it's a beta blocker, kind of brings down the heart rate, the blood pressure and all that together. And at the time, I, th I thought it was helping. I, I really did. I thought it was making some impact. But as I'm about to tell you, there's some things you need to really think about. And specifically, what I want to add here has to do with the interactions. Because every one of these drugs, and I haven't quite shown you all of them, but every one of these drugs that I've discussed with you, and any one that you take for that matter, can potentially have some interactions. Not necessarily side effects, not necessarily are they bad for you as, as a single standalone medication, but once you start taking combinations of medications, you really got to be sure you're involving your doctors, that if these medications are being prescribed by several different doctors, that they're all kind of talking back and forth and communicating so that nothing is really being put in that it's going to cause an issue, as well as your pharmacist. Sticking with a pharmacist, not many pharmacists, but sticking with a pharmacy and a pharmacist that works well for you is a great idea because it's part of their job when they go through and hand these medications to you, you know, out the drive through window, have you pick those up, mail order, whatever. It's actually their job to check and see what medications you're on and what the potential interactions may be. And what I have learned, and I really, I was shocked by this when I learned it just like yesterday is that I have a few medications that can be causing some interactions. And ultimately, drum roll, please, don't know this yet, but I'm, I'm happy if it is what it turns out to be, ultimately could be causing my issues. Again, lightheadedness, dizziness, uh, very low heart rates at time, higher heart rates at other times, palpitations, shortness of breath, all these things could potentially be coming back to a medication. Now, in the beginning, 
the first, that was in July, I complained. They added the medication. Long about September-ish, I went back in and, and complained of worsened symptoms. They suggested then that there's the potential that the metoprolol could be having the reverse effect. And that's possible. The metoprolol could be having a reverse effect. That is, it's lowering my heart rate too much. And by lowering my heart rate, my blood pressure too much, if I move quickly, bend over, try to do something really strenuous exercise-wise, it could cause that low heart rate could cause my heart to struggle to keep blood flow and oxygen through all my muscles, therefore give me a lot of weakness. I have a lot of weakness sometimes. And potentially metoprolol, even though it should be there to help those situations, can sometimes hurt. And so it's one of those medications. And what I've been doing the last week or so, we've just, it's been a long journey. Again, COVID has caused some of these appointments to get spread out. <laughs> so it's taken a while. But what we've been, been, been doing the last week is I've been taking my metoprolol. And instead of taking the 50 milligrams I'm typically on once a day, I'm splitting that in half and I'm taking a half a pill once a day. And that gives us balance, see? It's not that I'm altogether off of it, which this is a medication you don't want to quit cold turkey anyway, but I'm not off of it. I'm just taking half the dose. And I think to an extent that is helping. And so, you know, that's kind of where we left off. Still having some issues, still having some testing going on, more testing ahead, more communication, more doctor visits ahead. So hadn't discussed with all of this, at least, with my doctors yet, but that's some of the potential. But what I learned just yesterday is that another drug, which I have not mentioned yet, but I want to tell you about now that I'm on, uh, and I just lost, I don't know how to say these to begin with, but I'm going to try to say this one, omeprazole, maybe that's right, omeprazole, this drug right here is a medication that I started Back in July, at the same time, I started the metoprolol. So the omeprazole is a drug I started the same time I started the metoprolol. And I started this for a whole different reason. This one was to treat my heart-related symptoms, to deal with some issues. This one was because I went into the doctor and I said, Doc, I've been having some issues with some acid reflux, some heartburn, and because my family has a long line history of those type of issues, which have ultimately gotten very severe up to the point of uh, people in my family who have not treated that early enough, ended up getting cancer of the esophagus and passing away, I needed some help with that. And so what the doctor did, he put me on this omeprazole, which is, I don't know if it's an antacid, but it works similar to that. Basically, he put me on one of these a day. I took one, I'm sorry, one in the morning, one in the evening. I took one, and wow, I mean, within like uh, two weeks, no issues whatsoever. Thought nothing of it, no issues whatsoever. However, the symptoms of the lightheadedness, dizziness, fatigue, muscle weakness, uh, shortness of breath, all continued. So at least I'm thinking to myself, well, this drug here has helped this issue. So if this drug here would do its job to help this issue and this issue, the breathing, I'd be fine. So what's going on? Here's what I just learned. Omeprazole can prevent or block you from maintaining something we talked about long ago, magnesium. Now, my magnesium has always been low. Many of you have low mag. It's just part of the deal. Some of the other medications we're on can cause low magnesium. Therefore, you need to have that magnesium supplement. Truth in my life, for sure. Need the magnesium supplement. Even with the highest doses possible, again, three, 400 milligram tabs three times a day, 1,200 milligrams three times a day, maximum oral dose I take, my mag is still on the low end. What I didn't know is that this drug here, omeprazole, can block your body from keeping magnesium. Hence, in the last few clinic visits, strangely enough, even though I've taken all the magnesium I've been asked to and required to take, my mag levels have continued to trail down, have continued to fall. Now, what is that implying? There's actually an interaction here. 
This drug to treat acid reflux, heartburn, is preventing me from keeping magnesium in my bloodstream. And so this drug, metoprolol, which I'm taking to try to try to combat some of those heart type symptoms, again, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, dizziness, yada, whatever, it could be a problem. Matter of fact, I looked up low magnesium symptoms just a few minutes ago, just as a refresher. Guess what? Some of the symptoms, not all, but some of the symptoms are low magnesium are lightheadedness, dizziness, shortness of breath, irregular heartbeat, um, potentially headaches. Uh, not a big issue here. I'm trying to think of some of the other. But anyway, the ones I've even named. Friends, low magnesium could be causing, I'm not saying that it is, but could be causing all of my problems, or at least the majority of them. Therefore, I'm going in telling the doctors I feel like trash, and they're giving a few more medications, not knocking what they've done. They've done their very best, but they've given a few more medications, heart-related medications. I'm on the metoprolol uh, to help with that heart rate and, and blood pressure. I'm on fluorosamide or the Lasix to take off some of the fluid I'm maintaining, when all the while low magnesium could be causing that, and the low magnesium could just simply be a problem because I'm taking a meprazole for antacid. Or for acid reflux, heartburn. Is this going to be the case? I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. I'm glad I looked into it. I'm glad I sat down, and this is what I do. I sat down. I looked at every medication I was on for myself. Looked it up. Googled it three or four different websites. Don't just trust one. Googled it in three or four different ways. Looked at it. Looked at the side effects, which is not always the best I did. You can your mind can run you know run off of that. Be careful. But I looked at all the side effects and I started to say, wait just a minute. My magnesium could be low. Why in the world is my magnesium low? And then I'm watching a video inadvertently by the cardiologist that I, I know and love and trust. And he happened to mention in the video that if you're having trouble regulating your magnesium and your own and uh, a meprazole type drug, that could be your issue right there. And I was like, wow. So what am I saying? I've taken over 30 minutes. Most of you hadn't watched the video. I hope if you have watched to this point, you'll give me a thumbs up. I deserve a thumbs up if I've kept your attention for 30 minutes. <laughs> Maybe I don't, but maybe a thumbs down, maybe whatever you want to do. You be honest. What I'm saying is it is so important. Like I always say, take your medications on time, every time and in the right way. It is so important to know your medications, know what they're for, what the potentials are, what the side effects are, and even so important to know the potential interactions. Because you could be having issues, you could be having symptoms right now that are not a problem that are related to a failure or not a problem related to, you know, your anything about you. It could be a simple medication tweak that needs to be involved in. I don't know if this will help. I know some of you are on very different medications. Again, my disclaimer, but potentially you need to look into this. Thank you folks so much. If you've been watching this video and you're not already a subscriber, let me encourage you to go ahead and hit that big subscribe button. Again, like this video, share it out with friends, share it in some of your groups, whatever. Share it with anyone who can, you know, maybe get some benefit out of this. And uh, comment below. Comment below if you've dealt with any issues with interactions with your medications, what those were, what those are. I'm not a doctor. I know you're not. But we can still share. That's what this community is all about. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're doing great. Hope every day is a good day for you. And especially, stay stronger, my friends.